Ebert review police squad detective Leslie Nielsen beguiled by Priscilla Presley in The Naked Gun. Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman are FBI agents investigating racial violence in Mississippi burning. And a new home video release takes us behind the scenes of The Wizard of Oz. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert. say cops and women don't mix it's like eating a spoonful of Drano sure it'll clean you out but it'll leave you hollow inside too bad sugar puff we could have been something Leslie Nielsen stars as a foolishly hard-boiled cop in the naked gun the latest comedy from the makers of airplane it's one of the new films we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named The Naked Gun, and quite frankly, I don't believe this film either requires or even makes possible a serious <laughs> review. It is a completely dizzy, crazy, wacko, goofy, irreverent satire on police thrillers, and all I can tell you is I laughed a lot <laughs> out loud. That's the review. The movie's plot is only an excuse for a series of one-liners, sight gags, slapstick, and satire, and a lot of it goes exactly like this. Same old story. Boy finds girl, boy loses girl, girl finds boy. Has some very funny moments as a criminal sidekick. The movie stars Leslie Nielsen as a law officer who is investigating a bizarre criminal ring led by mastermind Ricardo Montalban, a man whose most prized possession in the whole world is his priceless fighting fish. I'm investigating the attempted murder of one of your dock workers. Well, this certainly comes as a shock to me, Lieutenant. But as you know, I am not the kind of man who takes this type of thing lightly. And there is no room in my organization for any type of criminal activity. The climax of the movie is a baseball game being attended by the Queen of England. Nielsen's assignment? To go undercover and stop an assassination plot. First, he doubled as an opera singer. Oh, say can you see by the dawn? Then he switches costumes and poses as an umpire. Let's see if that uniform's on straight. Put you get back here. Let's see you know, the shirt. Well, you should take a large one. That little tight in the crotch. Swing. All right. All set. All right. Okay, play ball. Strike. The Naked Gun was made by Jerry Zucker, Jim Abrahams, and David Zucker, the same team that made Airplane, Top Secret, and the TV series Police Squad. And as they explained in the press kit, for this movie, we ripped off Police Squad. If you've seen any of those comedies, you know the approach. The only objective is to generate as many laughs as possible at a breakneck speed, no matter how corny, how obvious, or how exaggerated. In fact, the worse, the better. You have to have the mind of a sixth grader to make these movies, and you have to have the mind of a fifth grader to enjoy them. But I guess the day I saw this movie, that was just about the level that I was operating at. Well, fifth graders are pretty smart, and yeah. I think there is a lesson to be learned, because the film is very funny, and you're right to just show the clips and say there's more of this. Uh, most comedies try too hard in a, in a strange way to force a laugh in a, in a, in a meter set up joke mm -hmm. here they just come flying in you have to you have to scramble around the frame of the film to catch it all you can't catch it all and they try the most outrageous things there's a scene where they come up to the hospital there's a, a car with a whole luggage rack but not one piece of luggage rack uh l luggage not not a whole bunch of luggage stuff on the car i mean a whole chain of, of uh trucks carrying luggage i mean why not have explaining that again why not have for our listeners who only have radio okay why not have 500 pieces of luggage is their theory. Yeah, Why yeah. not? It's just funnier, and I think it is funny. I think what Gene is trying to say is that after they leave the airport, they back up their rental car and they hook onto the whole train of the little carts, you know, that carry the luggage into the terminal, and then they yeah. carry all the luggage to the hotel. Was that 
That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I think they'd okay. even like the scene we just played right here. <laughs> Our next film is called Dakota, and it's yet another story of a young man on the run trying to deal with a bad relationship with his father. In recent weeks, we've seen such similar films as Tiger Warsaw, The Prince of Pennsylvania, at least I've seen those films. I don't know if anyone else has. Those films were losers, and Dakota is more of the same. Lou Diamond Phillips, the star of La Bamba, plays young John Dakota, assigned to work at a fancy Texas ranch as part of his punishment for disturbing the peace. At the ranch, he works as a mechanic and meets, naturally, the beautiful daughter of the ranch manager, who has, naturally, an uptight boyfriend. Well, I better go. He's going to be waiting for me. Listen, don't rush off. He's probably still standing in front of the mirror, putting on a little hairspray. Loose. Final. Will you knock it off? Whoa. Hi. Hi. Hey, Dakota. Hey, how's it going? Wouldn't you like to see a movie about a ranch girl who is ugly just once? Anyway, Dakota also becomes involved with a girl's handicapped young brother, and Dakota begins to grow up as he trains the boy. I can't do this. I told you I can't do this. You nips are your crazy ideas. Hey, wait a second. It's not my idea. I mean, this is just a job to me, man, you know? I mean, I can, you know, go tell them you're working out, and you can go fishing or tossing cow chips or whatever it is you do around here. I really don't care. But don't sit there feeling sorry for yourself and thinking this is going to be a piece of cake, because it's not. That scene is overwritten, as is the rest of this predictable movie. Dakota ends up literally in a race for his life involving the ranch owner's fancy vintage automobile and Dakota's own father. The movie sticks about four different stories together that might work on episodic television, but absolutely fall apart on the big screen. And I agree with you on this one. No. In fact, at the end, when the evil guys are going to set the barn on oh, fire and Dakota's going to be framed for it, fine with me. I'm thinking, you know, in literature they have source studies, you know, where they see where Shakespeare got his material. I imagine if you had a source study of this movie, you would find that there wasn't an original moment in it. Oh, no. Everything. You could just go through the movie, pointing out the 16 other movies that, you know. In fact, even the business about the rancher having the beautiful daughter, and I, he brings the, the kid home, and what do you know, he falls in love with the daughter, yeah. is absolutely cast in stone. I mean, the whole picture just marches along, and it's, uh, you know, then they throw in the child with, who's crippled and all that. I mean, it, that, that becomes sad because you're seeing some, potentially an Not interesting... Not to mention, of course, the beautiful horse. We don't yeah. want to forget the beautiful uh, horse. That's yeah. always important. And the yeah. race through the woods as oh, they meet for the first time. Don't forget yeah, that. On no. the, he on the motorcycle, she on the horse. We don't, we don't horse. have to forget the rancher saying that I believe this young man can do well if he gets yeah. another chance. Just give him life. one more chance. That's right. We yes. could recite this thing and so could a computer. When we come back, Mississippi burning. <laughs> The story of two very different FBI men who investigate a tragic civil rights murder in the South. Uh, you don't like me much, do you, boss? Sure, I like you. I just don't share your sense of humor. Our next movie is named Mississippi Burning, and this is an intelligent and powerful drama that I think is one of the top contenders for this year's Academy Awards. The movie stars Gene Hackman and Willem Dafoe, he was one of the co-stars of Platoon, as two very different kinds of FBI agents who are assigned as partners to investigate the murders of three civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1963. The Hackman character is a traditional lawman, cynical, tough, a veteran, he's seen it all. He believes sometimes in breaking the rules. Will this battle be lost? By mixing the races. We want beautiful babies, not ones with brown faces. Never, never, never I say, for the Ku Klux Klan is here to stay. Never, never, never I say, cause the Ku Klux Klan is here to stay. These Ku Kluxers are better with lynchings than they are with lyrics. Defoe was more laid back. He's one of the bright young lawyers Robert Kennedy had just hired for the Justice Department. And when the two men pay a call on the local sheriff, you can see their different approaches to the same problem. We're here to see Sheriff Stuckey. Sheriff's right busy now. You don't have to wait and come back some other time. We'll wait. Yeah. All right, Mark. Hey, take care of yourself. All right. <sighs> Listen to me, you backwoods. You, you get about two seconds to get the sheriff out of here. I'm going to kick the damn door in. Okay? Trying to develop leads on the Klansmen that he suspects were responsible for the disappearance of the three missing men, Hackman cultivates local contact. Simple fact is, Anderson, we got two cultures down here. White culture and the colored culture. Now, that's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be. The rest of America don't see it that way, Mr. Mayor. The rest of America don't mean jack. You in Mississippi now. Uh, that's for sure. 
And there you see part of a performance that is typical of Gene Hackman's greatness as the kind of actor who can convince us of the utter authenticity of his characters. Mississippi Burning is a lot more than simply a movie about a missing persons case. A lot of the film has to do with the very subtle development of a personal relationship between Hackman and a local woman played by Frances McDormand as the browbeaten wife of a local racist. She has supplied her husband's alibi for the murders, but will she change her testimony? A lot depends on the gentle way that the tough Hackman tries to understand her as, in fact, he seems to be almost falling in love with her. Mississippi Burning was directed by Alan Parker, one of the best and most interesting directors of the last decade. His credits range all the way from Midnight Express to Fame to Shoot the Moon, and here he has made the best film I've ever seen about the turbulent civil rights movement of the early 60s. It's quite a movie. I think it's a very strong movie, and I go down the line with you on the performances as distinguishing material. We've seen lots of pictures about two different kinds of cops paired together, so that is not new. In fact, when no. the movie started out, I thought, hey, here comes formula. But these two actors, let's, uh, Hackman, of course, you've m talked about. Let me focus on Willem Dafoe, mm -hmm. because when you said Willem Dafoe's name, you said you might remember him as the sergeant from Platoon. But this man is now uh, quite a presence himself. Yes, he is. Because he has The Last Temptation of Christ, playing obviously one of the most difficult characters to play, Jesus Christ. Uh, and he's done a superb job there. He does it again here. Mm -hmm. You could play this guy as uptight by the book and sort of wide-eyed at, at, at Hackman, but no, this guy has an integrity in himself, mm -hmm. and he doesn't give it up to Hackman, which happens in most of these paired cop pictures where one quickly is subordinate to the other. Mm -hmm. It's a very strong performance. Willem Dafoe, Willem Dafoe, ought to be, not have to be identified anymore with Platoon. He's a great distinguished actor, and I like the performance mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. of uh, Francis McDermott. That whole interplay is a, is a new wrinkle in an old story. Yes, it is. In fact, the entire movie is original, even though it could have easily been formula. Mm -hmm. You know, as I was watching it, in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. We've had a lot of stuff on television about the anniversary of President Kennedy's assassination. Right. And a lot of it has also included other stuff about that period. Mm -hmm. It's easy to forget that as recently as 1963, right. all of this stuff was still to happen. That a lot of things that we now take for granted hadn't happened yet. And the civil rights case was right at the center of things. This movie goes back to that period in history. And by recreating that one story, it brings back a whole chapter of American history. It's a very good film. Coming up next, Vincent, a biography of Vincent van Gogh using his letters to his brother and the photography of the actual places where the great artist painted. If one keeps on loving faithfully, one will gradually get more light and grow stronger. A remarkable new biography of Vincent van Gogh, whose paintings have long been among the most popular great paintings in the world, except, sadly enough, when van Gogh was alive. He only sold one of his works during his brief but prodigious lifetime. Australian director Paul Cox does a superb job of recreating Van Gogh's life, mixing film of the places where Van Gogh painted with his own words in confessional letters to his younger brother Theo, read in narration. Initially, Van Gogh wanted to be a member of the clergy. When he doesn't qualify, he is crushed. My dear brother, the three months probation have elapsed. They have told me that I cannot attend the school on the same conditions as the native Flemish pupils. It would not be easy to live without faith in God. He then throws himself into painting as director Cox tries to recreate the images that Van Gogh might have seen as were taken to his actual locations. For several reasons, I made up my mind to go home for a while. Drenta is splendid, but one's being able to stay there depends on whether one is able to stand the loneliness. I am sick at heart about the fact that coming back after a two-year absence, though the welcome home was kind and cordial in every respect, basically there has been no change whatever. The question of Van Gogh's sanity is always raised in discussions of his work. What emerges here is that he was above all else a morally driven man with high ideals who constantly questioned himself. The best we can do is to make fun of our petty griefs and in a way, of the great griefs of human life, too. I kept myself going on coffee and alcohol, I admit all that. But all the same, it is true that to attain the high yellow note I obtained last summer, I really had to be pretty well keyed up. Of course, riding above everything else are the paintings. But this film does something else in addition to giving us just the pictures of Van Gogh. It also inspires us to look more closely at what is in front of us. It inspires us to develop an artist's eye and sensibility, and that makes the movie Vincent very great indeed. When we're taking a look at the trees and the olive trees, 
uh, in particular. And I, so, I saw that in this film. I said to myself, why don't I see that? Mm -hmm. I can see it now, thanks to the director, thanks to Van Gogh, and the director thanks to Van Gogh as well for in inspiration. Why can't I see that? And I should look more closely at what is in front of me. This is one of the best movies I've ever seen about yeah, painting. Absolutely. I, I think the director, Paul Cox, has a director's eye, a visual eye for this material. Yeah. And he's able to make this movie on a very visual level. When the narration is read by John Hurt, uh, he's reading the letters that Van Gogh wrote about his own work. And who knows more about Van Gogh <laughs> than Van Gogh did. Right. So when he's talking about a particular kind of brush stroke, we are looking at a big close-up, not only of that kind of brush stroke, but there are times when you feel you're almost looking at the very brush stroke that Van Gogh was writing about. It's as if Van Gogh himself were taking you through these paintings layer by layer and stroke by stroke and and version by version and explaining to you what he was developing, what he was moving toward. Well, it's a fascinating Well, movie. when he talks about finding a new yellow, uh -huh. now that's a thrilling thing. I yes. mean, if you love painting, uh, and you, it is, it's thrilling to hear him talk about uh -huh. it, that this was not a man who was terminally sad at all times. He mm -hmm. was excited about his work. He was questioning the film does not, uh, uh, you know, gives... Uh, breaks ground in, in terms of not having us think that this was just a nutty man and that's how all great artists are. That, that yeah, you know, no. the lust for life notion uh, helped create the notion that you had to be crazy to be an artist. And I think that uh, here we see that you have to be fiercely uh, proud of what you're doing and, and trying to do your best to do great art. And there's another thing I like about what Paul Cox does. It's not just show and tell where he painted an olive tree and then here's a picture of an olive right. tree. Uh, what, po uh, what Cox does with his reality when he shows real things in the world is he arranges them in such a way that we're not, it's not that we're able to see what Van Gogh painted, we're able to see how he saw exactly. what he painted. Exactly. It's a tremendous achievement. Yes, it is. Coming up next, a special video segment on a fascinating new edition of the timeless classic, The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Wizard of Oz is by common agreement one of the most magical movies ever produced by Hollywood, a movie you can love when you're a kid and love even more when you're a grown up. It's been an almost constant release since it was first made in 1939 and it's a bestseller on videotape, but now a new Laserdisc edition of The Wizard of Oz from the Criterion Collection contains some fascinating additional material about the movie. I could while away the hours, conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain. And my head, I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. Everybody remembers this sequence from the movie, but the disc includes outtakes of footage that was trimmed from MGM's final release version. Here's how the longer version would have continued. Look at this. Don't worry if the camera seems to be shaking. These are rare home movies taken on the set of The Wizard of Oz by Harold Arlen, who wrote the music for the movie. His camera shows the trick behind those magical trees. Each one had a man inside to make the limbs move, and here's one of the special effects guys now coming up for air. All the critters got be dancing on a thousand toes. Die, she blew. The laser disc includes stuff you didn't even know you wanted to know, including footage from the 1925 silent version of the story. And there's a shot-by-shot -shot soundtrack commentary by film critic Ronald Haver. The Wizard of Oz is another in a new generation of laser discs for dyed-in-the-wool movie fans who want more than the movie. They want the history, the background, the coming attractions trailers, the original publicity stills, and everything else they can get their hands on. This is the definitive collector's edition of one of the greatest musicals of all time. Oh, you get things like the original drawings of the ruby slippers, which everyone is all the rage, and there was a big auction uh -huh. over, and you can see how they were drawn differently in the very beginning. You see uh, the, there's this radio play. Uh -huh. You see Marquis when they had a re-release with Judy Garland on it, and they didn't, because Judy Garland was so popular as a singer, uh -huh. they used an older Judy Garland rather, picture rather than uh, when she's older than yeah. uh, when uh -huh. uh, she was a little kid in the film. Uh, it's everything that there. We have to tell people that if you want to get this laser disc version, you have to have a laser disc player to put it in the, to play it. But uh, if you can do it, if you can afford to buy one, they run anywhere from about four and a quarter to seven hundred bucks. Uh, this is a whole c industry that we keep mentioning time and time again. It's worth investing in because you can get not only better sound, better picture, but you can get more material on great films. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for the Naked Gun, the nonstop laugh machine from the makers of Airplane. 
two thumbs down, way down, for Dakota, the utterly predictable story of a troubled youth. Two thumbs up for the civil rights drama Mississippi Burning, featuring a trio of great performances by Gene Hackman, Willem Dafoe, and Francis McDormand. Two more thumbs up for the exceptional film Vincent, which accomplishes almost the unthinkable in its own way. It's exciting as one of Van Gogh's paintings. So this was a very good week yes, with three fine yes. films. Mm -hmm. Vincent, Mississippi Burning, and The Laugher, The Naked Guy. And all three in totally different directions. That's the funny yes. thing about this job is that you really have to shift gears because how can you go from The Naked Gun <laughs> to, to Mississippi Burning to Vincent? You have to be extremely versatile. I'll, I'll take a week like and, this anytime. And I will too. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back to review Twins starring Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger as identical twins that quite a few people could tell apart. Oh, obviously. The moment I sat down, I thought I was looking into a mirror. And we'll also review My Stepmother is an Alien, starring Dan Aykroyd and Kim Basinger. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Nestle Crunch. It's creamy milk chocolate and crispy crunchies. Chocolate is scrunchious when it crunches. That's why you'll love Nestle Crunch. What's great for kids and parents? A bucket full of Duplo blocks and Lego bricks. Now you can store the toys that build great imaginations. After work or after workout, Daisy Turbo Spa combines powerful water massage and tingling aeration to turn your tub into a personal whirlpool. Sony Videotapes. For taping your favorite movies, trust Sony Dynamicron ES. Whatever your videotape needs, there's only one name to play back, Sony.